Welcome. We're waking up with watches and some of the finest we've ever had on the show. As usual, everything you see here is for sale. Names, references, and prices in the description below. And tmosto at thewatchbox.com. It is the direct purchase and pricing question line from you to me and my hand-picked crew, several of whom are in the room right now. Brandon, I'm looking at you, man. So remember, TMOS with the watchbox.com, and you were seeing some of these watches before they post to our website. So this is first dibs. Let's get started with an absolute monster. Let's get started with Debetun. Debetun of Lauberson, Switzerland. Born in 2002, a joint project between watchmaker and scientist Denis Flajolet and Italian collector and designer David Zanetta. Now, the company has produced many different styles, many different mechanisms, and innumerable patents perhaps the most vertically integrated and accomplished manufacturer of its size. I don't think any company has spent more money on research and development, pure R&D, relative to its size and output, and output is approximately 150 pieces a year. This is the DB25 Perpetual Calendar, a lovely guilloche metallic brown bronze dial, and a 44 millimeter rose gold case. You'd see the DB25 is a bit more conventional than a standard DB28. Well, that is the watch we often imagine when we think of this company. The DB25 is elegant, graceful, more versatile, and more conventional in its shape, even as it is just as innovative in its mechanism and function. Perpetual calendar, you have your day, or there we go, awesome focus there. You have your month, of course, you have your date, pointer style, and then you have an AM, PM, or I should say rather, you have a leap year indicator up at 12 o'clock and a spherical, that is true spherical, palladium and blued steel moon phase. Now the moon phase has an accuracy of 1,112 years, which means that is the reset interval. Unlike the 28, this one features a conventional crown, not a bullhead arrangement. And on the back, you can see that the movement is itself a work of art, a little bit of a science fiction case, as there is a ton of proprietary tech. As you can see at center, multiple jewels and a spring center that acts as a shock protection system for the rotor itself. So that is patented shock protected rotor, triple parachute, that is three shock protection mechanisms on the balance. That also is protected by a patent. One shock resistant spring, two shock resistant springs, and at center, Inca block for the balance staff. The hairspring itself is a flat hairspring, also patented, designed to give the same concentric beating behavior as an overcoil. And then the balance is actually a yoke shape comprised of titanium and platinum, designed to maximize the mass in the rim, as well as reduce aerodynamic encumbrance. Five day power reserve, of course, automatic winding, let's throw it on the wrist, 16 centimeters in circumference. You can see though this is a 44, it's an easy watch to wear, not overly broad. It's not encroaching on the edges of my wrist. As you can see, it's also reasonably flat, able to sit underneath a cuff and certainly underneath a jacket cuff. A truly special watch from one of the best of independent horology. This is the DB25 Perpetual Calendar in rose gold. Now let's talk a little bit about a more mainstream brand. A lot of folks tune in to see our Rolex content, and I'm not going to deny we often have fantastic pieces. This one has flown a little bit under the radar as it was lost in the 50th anniversary of the Sea Dweller back in 2017 and the arrival of the Pepsi Jubilee in 2018. This is the revised second generation Deep Sea Sea Dweller Deep Blue. This is the 126660 and as you can see it is the James Cameron dial. Now what sets this watch apart is that it is more wearable than its predecessor. Not as broad lug to lug, with a better match between the width of the lugs and the width of the bracelet end links. It's a better looking, better fitting version of the Deep Sea with the caliber 3235 three day automatic movement. Now, as before, absolutely extraordinary, 12,800 foot dive depth. It features a helium escape valve. It features that gorgeous gradient lacquer dial that shifts from blue to black, emulating the transition as seen by James Cameron in his Deep Sea Challenger submarine the namesake of this watch. You'll also note that if you look at the base of the dial, that shock of green down at six o'clock, we can get super close here, like a, like a case back shot. You can see the deep sea is actually that shock of signal green, the same color as Cameron's submarine. Now the timepiece is remarkably deluxe in its specification. As you can see, it features a glide lock system unlike any other, as you have that full 20 millimeters of incremental adjustment, but you can regulate it when it's on the wrist, so there's no chance of dropping it in a deep marine environment. So you have that incremental sizing that you can use for a precise fit, as well as, and by the way, how much do you love this? It feels as precise as it looks, like the bolt of a rifle. Pop it all open, and you also have flip lock, 
So as you can see, there is quite a bit of extension built in. Some of it all or nothing, some of it incremental. And if you look at the case back, this is one of the few titanium components you will ever see on a Rolex watch, as the case back itself is of titanium. And if you look at the dial side, you can see it speaks of the ring lock system. And that is essentially a super thick, nearly six millimeter thick sapphire on top of a cylinder of steel. And that's the plinth underneath the crystal. That's not simply a ray hook. That's a functional part of the sealing system. The cylinder is in between the sapphire and the titanium case back and it simply compresses like a sandwich to achieve the extraordinary 3,900 meters of water resistance. And again, for those of you who are saturation divers, if you're breathing heliox, there's your helium escape valve. Now, if that's a little bit too much sea dweller for a feller like you, I can say that there's an option that's both more wearable and more collectible. Made for three years only, this is the Sea Dweller 116600 Sea Dweller in 40 millimeters, made from 2014 to 2016. Three model years, a Rolex dive watch in steel, and discontinued after a short run. As you can see, no Cyclops size, so visually distinct from the Submariner. And to the credit of this model, it looks better and unencumbered. Now, the timepiece, as you can see, is thicker than a Sub, though not much, as it sits down low on the wrist thanks to the cupped case back. You can see this watch is distinctly more wearable on a small wrist than what we saw with the Deep Sea. More comfortable on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. You can see it's also better suited to everyday use. Now you still have a great deal of adjustability built in as we have the glide lock system, not the, not the on the wrist glide lock system that you saw with the Deep Sea, but we have both the glide lock adjustment and it slides up to 20 millimeters in two millimeter adjustments. You've got that, but then you've also got the, we'll pull it all the way out. You've got the flip lock system that we saw in the Deep Sea. So you do have those two degrees of adjustment the pullout and the slider, and you can see internally the glide lock system exposed at full extension. Now this watch is a 48 hour power reserve, both of them are COSC chronometers, and this watch of course 1,220 meters water resistant. This is your Sea Dweller 4000 for the modern era. All right, enough of that, let's go boutique. Let's talk about independence again. Let's talk about Laurent Ferrier. Laurent Ferrier is wonderful because they give you Patek Philippe levels of finish and they give you F.P. Journe levels of innovation, but they often do it with a little bit of a wry smile and a sense of humor. As you can see, this gorgeous, vertically satin-finished copper chrome dial has an explosive look on the wrist, incredibly reactive, even in the soft light of the studio. What sets this watch apart is that you get all of this in steel in a cushion case, and this is why I often say Laurent Ferrier has a little bit more of a joie de vivre about it. This is more adventurous than what you'll see from the likes of Patek, even as the case back with its double direct impulse on lubricated escapement reveals a movement as innovative as what you would see, for example, on the F.P. Journe Chronomet Optimum. Six position adjusted, micro rotor automatic, a jeweled staff and paw based micro rotor winding system, absolutely silent, no rattle, 21 six beat rate, overcoil hairspring, free sprung adjusted in six positions, one more than a standard chronometer. And as you can see, the anglage on the edge of these bridges is fat. The black polish on the skeletonized half bridge for the balance, immaculate, with four interior angles and a fifth at the center over the center wheel. Now the timepiece, of course, a remarkably accurate mechanism due to the combination of the overcoil, the double direct impulse, the six position adjustment, and of course the inherent pedigree, as this movement was a collaborative effort of Laurent Ferrier and La Fabrique du Temps, founded by the two-thirds of BNB concept that chose not to stay with Hublot. Now the timepiece wears easily, 41 millimeters, it's not a petite, delicate thing on the wrist. And in steel, it's gonna be everyday wearable, but you can see it at about 13 millimeters thick, this one wears easily underneath the cuff. It's an all-around dress watch with a hell of a lot of modern tech and traditional high horology finish on the back. This is a timepiece that makes no compromise. At 30 meters water resistant, not an aquatic timepiece, but let me show you the level of attention to detail here. You get a wonderful suede underlay. Beneath the strap itself, there's suede, which feels tremendous on the wrist. And if you look at something that's often considered a perfunctory default design on many watches, you even have this lovely, organic, almost biomorphic and fluid pin buckle. Even this has been thoughtfully and beautifully styled on the watch. Let's stick with our independence theme. 
Let's go to the folks from Belgium who manufacture in Switzerland Resence. And for 2017, they launched their Type 1 Squared, the first Resence watch in stainless steel. That's exactly what we have here. A little bit like our planetary regulator dial wire lug rodiumere. It feels very much that way. Stainless steel with minimalist lugs. You can see the case profile is more of a cushion than a perfect rectangle. And the dial features that orbital convex system wherein every individual feature of the dial rotates relative to the center even as every feature also rotates on its own axis. Now you can see, for example, we are looking at 11 a.m. on a Wednesday. How do we know? Well, there are seven semi-arcs, and you can see that the third solid arc moves in a clockwise direction on the day indicator. It is dead smack in the middle as we are looking at 11 o'clock right on the nose. So we are looking at 11 a.m. on a Wednesday. There's also a runner, which is an unconventional 90-second constant seconds operation indicator. As you can see, the dial is essentially flush with the sapphire, so visible from any angle. A wonderfully unconventional system used to set this crownless watch. Now this debuted with the the Type 1 squared, the case back setting lever, that is a brilliant mechanism. If you're going to set and wind with the case back, you may as well have some leverage to do so. Now, of course, the watch is automatic winding in addition to being manually windable, but you will set with the case back. Throw it on the wrist, nice and thin. A timepiece, as you can see, almost ducking under my cuff as is, but with a little bit more substance and solidity to it than you'll get with the Grade 5 titanium resonance watches. And for a lot of folks, a little bit of weight in a luxury watch is a good thing, and that's what this watch offers. One more time, let's take a look at the dial because it is genuinely a carnival on your wrist. Absolutely bonkers. No one else has ever told time this way before Resence. And this is one of the true innovations, one of the true left field ideas that is not simply a repetition of what came before in the watch industry. We like to say everything has been done before, not that. Now we talked about the UTTE from Arnold and Son a week ago, and I showed it to you in precious metal palladium, but let's take a look at rose gold. Another version of the watch launched in 2013, you can see that this one features a little bit more warmth to its 8.34 millimeter thick, 42 millimeter case, and you can see just how close coupled those lugs are. They turn almost straight down, and they barely protrude beyond the case, meaning ergonomically, this watch doesn't wear like a 42, it wears more like a 38. What sets this watch apart is the size of the tourbillon carriage, which is 14 millimeters across. Beaten away at 21.6, you can see it is nicely executed with a handsome sort of domed or arched carriage over the top, even as it is a flying tourbillon with no upper pivot. So it has only one pivot on the bottom, and you can see what sets the rose gold apart from the palladium. There is a freehand engraved and skeletonized balance bridge for the tourbillon on the underside. Combine that with the extraordinary Cote de Soleil radiating out across the bridges, the double spiral on the two caps to the two barrels. There are two barrels, manual wind. You're going to want to wear this one because it is an absolute sensation on the wrist and with long legs and 80 hour power reserve, in, despite the power intensive complication, you can really see how the shape of the lugs make the difference in the experience here because on my wrist, 16 centimeters, there is no difficulty accommodating this watch. And you can see because of its slender profile, that caliber 8200 is only 2.97 millimeters thick. It really sits low such that this could easily be your dress companion for black tie and tight cuffs. I know in Europe, it's considered to be a little bit gauche to wear a watch with black tie, but that's the way we do it in the States. Winding towards the end of our Indies theme, we have one of the independents of the moment, possibly the independent of the last 20 years, FP Journ. This is the Octa Automatic 40 millimeters in platinum. This example features the Havana dial, and as you can see, power reserve 120 hours, though FP Journ has noted to dealers that the watch will in fact run for seven days, uh, but the chronometric power reserve is 120. There is a double digit date with a quick set, and as you can see, several different textures on the dial. All of the printing is a lovely off-white that manages to be consonant with the deep Havana brown, evocative of tobacco, and of course on the case back, evocative of wealth, luxurious, opulent, solid gold movement. As you can see, this is the caliber 1300.3. So you have the free sprung balance, you have the 18 karat rose gold bridges and plates, a 22 karat gold winding mass with a lovely Grand Dorge or barley corn pattern, black polish on the FP Journe logo. You have circular Cote de Genève across the bridges. There's an engine turned perlage below the balance and you can see all of the screw heads have been black polished. It's a substantial watch with a platinum case and a gold movement. You feel like you're wearing something larger even as the eye tells you this is a compact and traditionally sized 
modern men's dress complication for a timepiece with a week-long power reserve and a double-digit date and automatic winding and a power reserve indicator. It is nice and slender on the wrist and not excessively broad across the wrist. Once again, 16 centimeters, and I can recommend this watch for a much smaller wrist as you can see my clearance on both sides. Let's talk a little bit more about some brands we love, but let's talk about a mainstream brand or a quasi mainstream brand from the Swatch Group. It's nice when you can talk about a dive watch being built as nicely as a high horology dress watch. And that's exactly what you have with the reference 5015 50 Fathoms. Now this model bowed in 2007 at Basel World and essentially Blancpain got it right out of the gate. 45 millimeters in stainless steel. You can see this hand polished case features an extraordinary degree of gloss and gleam. If you look at how the, the lugs are broken out from the case band, Blancpain went overboard, nautical pun intended giving this watch a large amount of definition and charm. It's not the blended lug profile that you see on a Rolex, for example, and you can really see the difference when you hold the sheer indistinct side of the deep sea alongside the wonderfully rich and nuanced side of the 50 Fathoms. Now you'll also note, unlike Rolex, which uses spring bars, Blancpain uses hex screws and bars to fix the sailcloth strap to the case. The bezel has a wonderful action. Let's hear it against the mic right here. I've got a mic. You can hear it's chunky, it's pronounced. You can also hear that it's distinct from the Rolex bezel. Here's the deep sea. The Blancpain bezel is more pronounced, more vocal, more mechanical. The Rolex, it has a little bit more of a glide to it. Both are good, but ultimately it is the sapphire cap and the cambered sapphire cap on the 50 Fathoms that sets this model apart. You can see it's not just a sapphire capped bezel, but it has a rounded dome-like profile that makes it look as though it's permanently immersed in an enormous toroidal dewdrop. Now you can see on the dial, you have quarter Arabics as well as applique indices and broad sword style hands that come to a syringe-like point. Because of the sapphire cap, you get a tremendous amount of coverage and protection from scratches with that bezel, and the entire bezel itself is loomed. Underneath the case back, which you will note is rendered anti-magnetic by a soft iron inner cage. Protected down to 300 meters, you have the caliber 1315, five day power reserve, six position adjusted, free sprung, 28 eight beat rate, stop seconds, quick set date, three mainspring barrels, and you've got that 120 hour power reserve. So it is a high horology movement that is hand finished and handsomely so. It's a nicely made watch inside and out with a hand finished case, hand finished dial, and of course, hand finished and regulated movement. Despite the size of this watch, at only about 50 millimeters lug to lug, even my smaller wrist can wear it, and the strap is the way to wear it. One final note on the strap, though it is comprised of almost indestructible sailcloth, the underside is coated with natural rubber to give you a wonderful supple feel so that aggressive coarse material doesn't aggress against your skin. Sticking with our high horology dive watches, this is a model that came out in 250 pieces back in 2002, and it marked Jaeger LeCoultz's return to sports watches in earnest. This is the master compressor Memovox in full platinum with an explosive blue sunburst dial. And as you can see, the hands as well as the indices and the numerals evocative of the Polaris 68. Remember, the tribute to Polaris did not come out until 2008. This was a full six years ahead of the curve. 41.5 millimeters in platinum. The watch features an internal rotating bezel just like the original Polaris, but it also features the half turn locking system of the compressor crown. So you have these little winglets that will tell you red, you're dead. The system is open. Now you can manipulate and wind and then white, you're tight. Everything closes up. Let's hear this watch before I close it up because it is a wonderful alarm. I think I almost had it. And that can be achieved with a platinum case because JLC uses a hanging bronze gong that's actually inspired by traditional Japanese temples. And because the gong hangs separate from the case, the platinum case doesn't in any way damp the volume, the sustain, or the singing lyrical tone of that musical alarm. Now, 100 meters water resistant with an internal rotating dive bezel, you could see that it does have that 
Polaris 68 like internal rotating bezel. So if you wish, you can line up the index with the minute hand and now you have that impromptu zero to 60 minute count up timer. The case back likewise in platinum and you can see this watch has been through the 1000 hours control 45 hour automatic caliber 918 inside. Individual numbering out of the 250 pieces you can see a feature lost after 2005. When JLC started equipping its platinum watches with white gold clasps, this is the real thing. PT950, you can see it inside the clasp. And the clasp, by the way, both blasted and polished, double finished. You get platinum with platinum on this 2002 limited edition. A very special watch. Let's take one last look at it on the wrist. The strap is navy blue with a double contrasting white stitch, which looks absolutely awesome. And JLC helped to pioneer the double stitch back in the early 2000s when it launched this line and the straps to accompany them. This is probably the best all-around travel watch you're going to find. I love that piece. Not so much because it's a dual time. Dual time watches are great for travel, but if you're traveling to an adventure, I would rather have a dive watch and of course an alarm to wake you up when you're out of your native time zone. Let's talk a little bit, oh I don't know, about a watch that represents the most accessible point of entry to this table. And that is the late 2017 release Seiko Presage SPB069, 40.5 millimeters in stainless steel. Let's get a good look at that dial, which is blue enamel. That's right, the dial itself, let me see if I can move back and I get a better sense of the blue of that dial. It is blue enamel and you can see the complex contours of the baked enamel dial as well as the lovely set of off-white hands and Roman numerals. Note the use of a watchmaker's four as well as the lovely palm style hand for the hour and the leaf style hand for the minute. There's also a lovely yellow varnished lunette counterweight to the needle style seconds hand. In, the reverse side of this 1500 piece limited edition, protected down to 100 meters, you've got the 6R15, 50 hour power reserve, manufacturer movement, Seiko even makes the stones for the pivots, the shock protection, and the lubricants, a fully integrated manufacturer. And this timepiece is a wonderful point of entry into the world of enamel, into the world of luxury horology, and of course into the universe of Seiko, which runs from watches priced below 100 bucks all the way up to the Crador Minute Repeater. This timepiece is stunning and uncompromised, and again, comes from one of the great brands in luxury horology. A lifetime serviceable watch, this is not one of the disposable Seikos, and you wouldn't have it any other way from the watch box. If your budget for a blue dial on a strap runs a little bit higher, we turn back the clock almost a decade now to 2013 in Basel World when the Rolex Date 8 Color Series bowed, and this is the 118139 in white gold. A blue sunburst dial, a white gold case, a white gold fluted bezel, white gold hands, luminescent indices, white gold Rolex crown, and of course, white gold crown, a twin lock with the signature double dots on the flank of the case. Inside, of course, you have caliber 3155, 48 hour power reserve, double quick set, chronometer certified, and 100 meters water resistant if you wish to put the watch on a water resistant band. Note that there's a little bit of an inserted shoulder on the end of the lug designed to create a very integrated combination of strap and case so there's barely any daylight showing through. Of course, you get a full Rolex white gold deployant clasp. How often do you see a Rolex on a strap with a deployant clasp? Not often. Throw this 36 millimeter gem on the wrist and you can see why this was easily the most charismatic watch launched in the Day Date family in the entire decade of the 2010s. That's, that's a bit of an ambitious claim considering what came during that decade, but I think this watch is probably the most roundly pleasing Day Date of that decade. Handsome, discreet, nicely sized, versatile. You can see it's not overly broad, about 44 millimeters from lug to lug. Nice and compact and easy to fit underneath a sleeve. I have to ask, in a world where Rolex's oyster case watches can be this handsome, this adult, this refined and elegant, why do we need the Cellini collection? This should just be the Rolex dress watch. All right. Let's talk about bracelets. Let's talk about bracelets and versatility. We've spoken about travel watches, blue dial watches, bracelets and straps, but what about a watch that puts a ton of complication pedigree, resistance, refinement, and history behind it? And that's what you get with the Omega Seamaster Aquaterra Chronograph GMT. 43 millimeters in stainless steel. You can see this is a full bracelet coaxial chronometer GMT with a second time zone in 24 hour format. You have the chronograph. Note the mono counter with chronograph minutes and hours on one dial. You've got the date. Of course, you've got that teak deck concept, blue metallic dial, and you can see the sub registers are sunken. A nicely 
symmetrical by register design because of the presence of the mono counters. You've got the chronograph hours and minutes here, and then you've got constant seconds and the second time zone over here. And note, the second time zone hand is loomed. In fact, every hand that is used to tell conventional time, you've got your chronograph seconds hand, you've got your hour hand, you've got your minutes hand, and you've got your second time zone. Those are all loomed. High grade applique index dial, and as you can see through the case back, the sensational caliber 9605 twin mainspring barrels, coaxial chronometer, 60 hour power reserve, vertical clutch, and let me see if I can get a better target for Sean here. I'm not helping him out. Coaxial chronometer, vertical clutch, and column wheel, full balance bridge, free sprung, silicon hairspring, very water resistant at 150 meters and virtually amagnetic with that SI14 Omega silicon hairspring. Throw it on the wrist and though it's big, it's not overwhelming. While the Royal Oak Offshore may in some regards be a more hand finished watch, it is not a more advanced or more capable watch, nor does it have more personality or presence on the wrist. And if you're thinking of going that route, let me remind you, this exists and you need to consider it seriously because you're getting a better machine in many regards for a fraction of the money. Now let's stick with Omega and let's talk about a more vintage take on the Seamaster family. This is the 2017 anniversary piece, of course. This is the CK2913 Tribute. This is the 3,557 piece limited edition, 39 millimeters in stainless steel. As you can see, it features a wonderful bubble-like cambered sapphire to give you that vintage plexiglass inspired aesthetic, but you will note that there is the little Omega logo that would have appeared on the original plexiglass crystal. You can see that floating over the center of the dial. Broad arrow, minutes and hour hands, a lovely fotina that actually works better here than most. You can also see the use of the quarter arabics, the wedge style indices, and the vintage Omega logo and marquee. Now, true to history, this is a bi-directional rotating bezel, and the timepiece with a 55 hour coaxial chronometer power reserve fits well on the wrist. You will see they made some concessions to modernity in the design of the bracelet, which is fixed in place by screws for removable links, as well as the push button slider inside the clasp for micrometric adjustments. So you do get a little bit more technology, though you don't get a display case back. I want to be clear about that. You can see every individual link of the bracelet that is removable is fixed in place by a screw. So you can size this one easily with screwdrivers, no pin sleeves here. Throw it on the wrist, and because it is a minimally beveled, squared off lug, it has that pre-guard case. This is before the watches like the, the 165024 that would debut those lyre style lugs and a broader 42 millimeter steel case. This is a 39 and it wears a 39. It's also reasonably slim for an automatic winding diving coaxial. So as these things go, one of the best options in an Omega that could go either way as your dress watch or your sports watch and it's certainly swimmable. Omega was prescient. Back in 2003, it launched a watch that was thin, automatic, 100 meters water resistant, stainless steel, and blessed with a beautifully integrated full bracelet and a cushion style case. Sound familiar? Well, the times have caught up with the 2003 Omega Constellation Double Eagle. The timepiece, 38 millimeters in stainless steel and 100 meters water resistant is the best of everything. You've got the Griffin Claw style constellation, but in a more masculine and sporting package than the traditional Manhattan Consti constellations. The Manhattan Connies oftentimes are viewed as watches for women, but the Double Eagle was positioned to be purchased by men and it succeeded. As you can see, a relatively sunder case and a lovely set of countersunk and interlocking minor and major lugs. This is a fully integrated bracelet watch with one of the most uncommon case back features on a caliber 2500 Omega of any description. Let's try to get the light. There we go. This is a rare display case back coaxial chronometer caliber 2500C. 100 meters water resistant and you can see the movement that represented the revolution of 1999 with the arrival of the coax. You can see that it is a thin watch. It's nicely bound to the wrist, and because of the way the bracelet forms around your wrist, it fits exactly like a glove. You can also see how thin it is, and in many regards, this is now a style that's been vindicated by market trends of our time, and I feel like collector tastes and rivals are just now catching up with what Omega was doing in 2003 with this watch. This was not designed to knock off the Royal Oak or the Nautilus. This was designed as a blue sky concept for what had previously been a pure dress watch line. This timepiece 
threads the needle between a dress watch and a sports watch while successfully launching itself into the world of the all-arounders, a watch you can wear all the time. And yes, it is loomed. That is an undersung hero of 2000s watchmaking. Now let's talk a little bit about Patek Philippe because it is, after all, the great rival to every high horology intender and pretender and the Grand Dame, or Le Doyen, of Geneva. And here we look at a fourth series, 36.2 millimeter, but a Patek Philippe 3970. And this is a 3970 in exquisite platinum, black, absolutely breathtaking, wearable, versatile, and blessed with that Lemagne 2310 based CH2770 on the reverse side. 65 hour power reserve, gyro max, free sprung balance, overcoil hairspring formed by hand, and of course you have that column wheel lateral clutch action. You could see the lateral clutch moving away from and then back into contact with the driving center wheel on the chronograph bridge, and that is why you want a manual wind lateral clutch chronograph. It is not the most sophisticated architecture. It is simply the most beautiful. This is old school. All these watches were made between 1986 and 2004, which means all of them, especially this fourth series watch, they do include the Geneva Hallmark, not the later Patek Philippe seal, and for most, that is simply a more evocative, nostalgic, and romantic stamp. You can also see just how much it glints and gleams as I move it through the light, and we try to defeat my glare from these overheads. We are working on refining the studio, folks. It's a work in progress, and you can see just how beautifully executed this movement is. Needs no elaboration, it speaks for itself. Throw it on the wrist, comfortable, a combination of a black dial and a white metal. This one's easy to wear on any wrist, and if you are a lady with a taste for men's watches, this is the best option. A no-nonsense, no-excuses, high-complication, perpetual calendar chronograph that can fit on any wrist, and as you can see, duck underneath any cuff. A very, very, very special watch. Very, very, very special. And in platinum, despite its size, it's a redoubtable thing. Let's jump back to Omega for a moment, because I feel like we did not shout out the most interesting Omega on the table, and that is the dark side of the moon. Launched in 2013, this timepiece is 44.25 millimeters in full black ceramic, but what really sets it apart is the combination of the black ceramic dial the black ceramic tack, and of course, the finishing on the case that is exactly the same as you would get with steel, satin sides, polished bevels, and you can see the contrast between them. It's subtle but exquisite, and it's executed with diamond-tipped milling tools. Now, you've got the conventional set of twin registers that we saw in the Aqua Terra, where you have constant seconds and then a mono counter with both the chronograph hours and minutes. A vertical clutch column wheel chronograph, you can see this one's the caliber 9300 on the reverse side, 60 hour power reserve, twin barrel, and it features a function that you would not have seen on the Aqua Terra because the Aqua Terra gives up one of the refinements of the basic 9300 caliber in order to have two time zones, and that is the independent stepping time zone hour hand. Note the watch is still ticking and keeping time, and you can even adjust the date in both directions as you cross the international date line. White gold hands and indices on that black zirconium oxide, gleaming glossy dial. This was a flagship piece. And when you throw it on the wrist, the fact that it's only about 50 millimeters lug to lug and feather light made almost entirely of sapphire and ceramic, so almost impossible to scratch. The watch is also nice and light on the wrist, and even on a smaller wrist, you can find this one wears comfortably and looks right. As you can see, it's not terribly broad. I've got clearance on both sides of my wrist, so I could probably go down to a 14 centimeter circumference wrist size and still wear this one well. Omega, exhausting every opportunity to refine this watch, gave it a full ceramic buckle and pin. This is where on, for example, an Ublo ceramic watch, you would see some sort of PVD steel or titanium bit that's gonna get scratched up immediately. Instead, Omega and the remarkable industrial technology of the Swatch Group, able to create a durable pin buckle in ceramic to match the watch. A very special timepiece and one of the all-time greats. Let's talk a little bit more about Patek, a model launch back in 1993. This is a handsome officer-style case, the 5059, and this is the 5059 in white gold. So you can see the timepiece with a retrograde perpetual calendar. You've got a retrograde date with a scale from 1 to 31, and then you've got the day, you've got the month, you have that retrograde date, and then up at 12 o'clock, there's actually a leap year phase indicator, and then there's a moon phase down at the base that is reset once every 122 years. So that actually has a longer duration than the perpetual calendar, which needs to be reset in the year 2100. Now I'm gonna quickly roll this one through the date change. 
so you can watch the action and also see the indicator for the date. The timepiece featuring this look of a pocket watch converted to a wristwatch, evocative of the 1914 to 1918 World War II trench watches built for officers that were basically pocket watches with lugs welded on, held in place by screw-fixed bars. That's why these straps are fixed in place by screw-fixed bars. It was impossible to reach for your pocket when you were manning a gas mask or a machine gun or on the move in a trench. Therefore, that was the era when the wristwatch first came into its own. And after the war, many continued to prefer the wristwatch format until approximately 1937, 1938, when wristwatches finally surpassed sales of pocket watches. And the officer's watch was an important link in that chain of evolution. You can see that there is an onion-style crown, uh, evocative again of pocket watches, and a little plinth underneath that doubles as a brilliant, you can see that little plinth, it doubles as a brilliantly hidden hinge for the hunter style case back, another pocket watch feature. You can see the balance. This is a caliber 315 base Geneva Hallmark perpetual calendar retrograde, five position adjustment with a free sprung gyro max balance. And the watch has a nice feel on the wrist because of the solid case back. It's a little bit heavier than you would expect on a modern sapphire case back watch because of that extra precious metal. 36 millimeters, this one sits and wears really nice. So if you liked the Rolex date eight that we had on earlier, if you liked the Patek Philippe 3970P, but you don't quite have that kind of coin, but you want to stay in the world of Patek and perpetual calendars, this is one of the most distinctive Patek Philippe watches of any era. Instantly recognizable as a Patek officer's case and a perpetual calendar. Beautifully finished inside and out and very special. You can see just how much clearance it has on both sides of my wrist. And there is a full white gold deployment clasp to match. See, what do we, I always miss a watch, so I wanna make sure before I jump to the end, we don't miss anything. And it's a good thing I looked because believe it or not, this is not the closer for today's episode. It is, however, exceptional. This is the Grubel Forcey Tourbillon 24 degrees incline. Now you can see it is an extraordinary Tourbillon 24 degrees, and that is the angle of the Tourbillon carriage itself. The thickness, the depth of this movement is almost 10 millimeters, so you can look into it diagonally, not just from straight overhead, but from an angle to better appreciate both the finish and the engineering from almost any angle. As you can see, the case flank featuring a lateral viewing port so you can really get into the tourbillon carriage and the escapement. You can see that the timepiece features an extraordinary case with actual concave mirrored lugs. You can see probably best from this angle, that the lug profile itself is concave and mirrored. It's a little bit like a, a reflecting dish or a bowl. And the nuances of the case, in spite of its 43.5 millimeter size, speak to an attention to detail and a design department that does not rely exclusively on brute force or presence. But make no mistake, the watch has both. Manual wind, 72 hour power reserve with a power reserve indicator. The scale underneath the power reserve is actually satin finished white gold. Now the timepiece, of course, I'm going to throw it on the wrist, is large and in charge. Make no mistake, this is a timepiece of extraordinary wrist presence. A, a timepiece that I can only describe as absolutely explosive. It explodes off the wrist. You can see that when it is held erect, the dial is approximately one quarter tourbillon. And when you turn it to show the corresponding reverse side, this is where the real high horology finish hits you. As you can see, they use German silver bridges. And the bridges are frosted on their tops. They're composed of what would be known as Maichot in the lingua franca, French, of La Chaux de Fonds, where this watch is made. So you have that, those German silver or Maichot nickel copper zinc bridges. You have a lovely set of mile-wide chamfers and bevels on every edge, as well as note interior angles. You have enormous blued screws. And you'll also appreciate the presence of the jewels set in golden chiton. So all of the pocket watch design vernacular present and correct. Also note the extraordinary spiral of the Cote de Genève at center and the engine turned perlage just below this rose gold engraved plaque declaring the 24 degree inclined tourbillon. Also note the freehand engraved and inked rose gold Grubel Forcey badge. Once more on the wrist, this is a big watch, though it's not a broad watch across the wrist. I expected it to overhang my wrist. I can actually say down to 15 centimeters circumference, you're going to wear this one well and comfortably. Have a listen. That is the sound of a machine 
with a heartbeat. So what could possibly one-up that? Well, we discussed last week Patek Philippe's 5078P, and we showed it with a black lacquer dial. But if you want the whole loaf, you want the same watch. Launched in 2005 with a white Grand Faux enamel dial. Platinum watch, minute repeater, micro rotor automatic, 38 millimeters, and as you can see, a Grand Faux enamel dial of extraordinary luster and life. It practically jumps right out of the case. It has an incredible glossy gleam and reflectivity. Now, as you can see, the watch has all of the requisite refinements. Here we see welded lugs. Here we see high horology finish. Here we see the best of the best in terms of execution, as there is guilloche rose lathe work, again, that grand d'orge or barley corn on the winding rotor itself. This uh, caliber R27T with 44 hour automatic winding power reserve and a minute repeater is immaculately executed. And you can see that's right down to the black polish of the strikers for the repeater mechanism itself. Let's fire this one up, see how close I can come to 1259, which would be the ideal send off for this episode. Nailed it. As you can see, the ultimate indiscretion, nary a hint on the dial side of what you're wearing. The ultimate three-hand watch, perhaps. This is the Patek Philippe 5078P in exquisite platinum with Grand Faux enamel dial, and look how, much, look how much clearance I have on both sides. Let's see if we can do a case back of the striking action before we sign off. and you can see the governor stop right underneath the Calatrava cross. One more wrist shot and that's it. Sean, you did a great job today on the macro shots. An internet round of applause for Sean and all the guys in my crew who have worked to set up this studio. It will continue to improve. Patek Philippe 5078P. Guys, tmasa with the watchbox.com. Everything you see here is for sale. Price is in the description. Reach out to me and my crew. Brandon and I mind this email line. You will get an immediate response. Thanks to you. Thanks to my ever-growing crew. Time out, Tim out. Thanks for logging on.